Uh, Fatima is going to continue on as we have a new panel discussion starting now, and it would be great for you to engage not just with Fatima, but also with Dr. Nicolina and Basil. Uh, Dr. Nicolina is actually um, knows very well about Question Pro. She has been one of our great promoters, but also she is the department chair. Uh, of management and market research and logistics at the American University in the Emirates. She has more than 15 years of experience um, in qualitative and quantitative market research. Uh, along with her, we also do have Basil, who is the research director at, Ven at Ventures Middle East. Uh, he has basically led the direct management of multiple projects across you know, the government sectors and other sectors. I have personally worked with him myself, and I can say that he's an expert when it comes to any kind of market analysis, whether it's competitor analysis, any kind of strategy, brand tracking, customer satisfaction. So we truly have a great, great panel coming in, and uh, I think this is going to get so much more interesting for you to take your questions forward with them. And Ken, who, you know, who's already spoken to us, is going to be leading this panel. So look forward to this. Uh, thank you so much, uh, guys. Ken, uh, Ken, you can continue. Thank you, Sindhu. Um, so the topic of the panel discussion is adopt versus adapt. I mean, there's uh, the scope of a new experience strategy during the pandemic. And um, obviously, we haven't, we've touched on it a little bit, but the worldwide impact of COVID-19 really cannot be ignored when it comes to developing customer experience strategies. Um, but, you know, adjusting strategies, as we all know, sometimes kind of comes at a very significant cost, uh, whether it's a temporary adjustment or a permanent adjustment. So over the next uh, 25, 30 minutes, uh, I'm hoping that we'll have a lively discussion uh, about CX strategy changes that we've experienced, we'll soon experience uh, later as the result of the pandemic. Or, uh, and then for the purposes of this discussion, we'll, we'll define some terms. There's ADAPT, which is making immediate changes in the processes or protocols without fully understanding uh, how long they'll be in place. And then there's ADOPT, which is uh, we're going to make this permanent policy uh, and expect it to be in the place for the long term. And I, I think I, I like to use the example, uh, if we think about airlines, and believe it or not, I've flown a lot during this time, um, but they continue to adapt their policies regarding face masks based on new information, um, which make the protocol either more or less restrictive. However, airlines have adopted a new sanitation approach, which includes the electrostatic spraying of the, the alcohol and to ensure viruses COVID and others don't carry over from flight to flight. And so with that in mind, uh, we, we want to talk about adopt versus adapt. And I, I want to start with sort of an everyday topic. Uh, most of us in the audience participate in grocery shopping. I mean, and, and that's changed a lot. In my corner of the world, we have employees with masks. We have one-way aisles. We have social distancing circles. I was never very good at that in school, so I, I don't know why they thought I'd be good at that now. Uh, but to wait in lines, there's plexiglass barriers between you and the employees. That's a huge difference in how we used to interact. Um, and, you know, one thing that I do like is the plentiful supply of cart wipes and uh, sanitation teams that clean the store on an ongoing basis. So I'll ask the panel, um, which steps are adaptations? Which ones are going to be permanent? And have we yet to uh, see the critical, uh, what's been critical to the CX strategy in the industry? Dr. Nicolino, let's start with you. Hello and good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to see you, some of you, even in, in, in this form on Zoom and to be the part of this panel. So uh, as Kenneth said, uh, we all are feeling and uh, we are living the impact of COVID-19. And uh, as many said, uh, like nothing will be same and things will change and they're changing continuously. So what's here, I really love the uh, approach adopt versus adopt, uh, because I think this is the big question now, actually. What's here to stay? And uh, what are we just, what are the changes that we are just continuously making? And as you mentioned, we are making different changes, like the airlines, well, is an, and they are an excellent example. So there are new procedures, there are new protocols, and they are developed on a literally weekly basis or monthly basis, depending on input that we are actually having. Uh, so to better understand what's going on, 
we need to understand first what was going on before. Uh, we had digital, uh, uh, if we are talking about, if we're focusing on, let's say, grocery shopping, because this is something that impacts all of us. I mean, we all have to eat, so we all have to buy our groceries somewhere. Uh, so uh, this is definitely something with a, with a global impact of the grocery sh uh, shopping. Uh, so what we had before? Uh, we had two typical channels that we have for everything else. So basically, uh, we had the analog, the old fashioned, you know, you go to grocery store, you pick your fruits, milk, whatever you want to buy, you put it in a cart, pay and go. Halas. And then you had a second part uh, that are uh, digital natives and the people who were already uh, ordering, uh, especially now coming from Dubai. And, uh, you know, during the summer, we really, really like to order and, and, and to use delivery. I mean, here, unlike maybe some other countries globally, this is something that uh, we are kind of used to. And uh, the typical uh, digital natives, the younger generation, the generation that are digitally proficient, uh, they are uh, using, they sometimes even prefer to use those channels. And then you have the standard, uh, aside from them, you have like the older generation, but still digitally literate and uh, like the usual, the uh, digital immigrants, the one who had to adopt over the time. But I think what emerged now is something that I came up with a like new term, uh, I like to call them digital refugees. And digital refugees <laughs> are actually people uh, like older generation. And I'm sure that uh, many of you have the similar examples in your own families. Uh, like I give you example, my um, aunt and uncle, they're 70, 70 years old. They are traditional shoppers. They go, they, they, they go grocery shopping. What happened? There is a lockdown. They cannot go out or even now when uh, it's kind of easier, they still don't want to go out. So what they had to do, they had to learn and they have to adopt. And guess what? What they're saying now? Well, you know, it's good. We really were. And they were um, hesitant about, you know, online payment. Uh, there was an issue of trust. And in some cases, this uh, issue of trust was really, really hard to be overcome. But over uh, the time, they're not saying, we're going to continue ordering online. So uh, from one example, I'm sure that many of you can share the similar examples from your environment. You can see how uh, the environment and how behavior is changing. However, is this... Uh, behavior here to stay permanently or how this is going to develop uh well this is a uh, one mil million or few million dollars questions i cannot give you a response to that actually uh the worldwide agencies and uh, market research companies are trying to find some response and uh, recently there have been many studies that uh, that, that were covering this and uh, for example, I would like to, if you want to, I know to take a lot of time, but uh, to, to find out more, Ernst & Young did recently really good uh, uh, research on future consumer index. And uh, they actually identified several types of consumers uh, that emerged during the COVID. And they have some ideas on how this might develop in the future, but still we don't know. The first thing is uh, we don't really know how long this is going uh, to stay. If I ask any of you, how long do you think that we'll be seeing each other like this? And when's the next time when we can all like sit in a, one room and have discussion and meet and interact face to face? Sorry, we don't have a clue. We don't know that. So basically, uh, from the psychology perspective, uh, new behavior is usually you need around two to three months to adopt new behavior. This is ongoing too long. Uh, so, yes, we can expect changes to stay, even when it comes to day-to-day -day behavior. With some things, it might go back. But we still need to see how long this is going to be and uh, what are the things that, are, uh, that the companies are going to consider when they are approaching like this new sets of consumer and new consumer habits and new consumer expectations. So uh, the adaptation uh, has to uh, be, but the level we, we will need to see over the time to start with this. And Fatima, I'll, I'll follow up with that one. I mean, there, there's a few industries that have been propped up um, by the pandemic. Uh, I've, I'm probably guilty of uh, a lot of grocery delivery because I had to sit in quarantine a total of 42 days because of my travels back and forth. Um, 
that I mean, they've certainly been in the spotlight during this time, and uh, we're on one of those forums right now, Zoom. I mean, it's been you know, it's taken off like crazy during this time. So you know, these industries they need a functional and and in a lot of cases an emotional need right now. And in your view, how will these companies that have benefited from the pandemic? need to adapt their CX strategy after the pandemic to continue that momentum? And do you see other industries that may have benefited or that will see benefit in the future? So, yeah, there are many other industries. I mean, of course, grocery stores and um, the restaurant delivery industry has uh, seen a great increase, but uh, even the schooling industry I mean, the educational industry, the healthcare industry, I mean, uh, has seen a massive uh, uh, increase. Uh, I mean, who thought that schooling was possible completely online, you know? And uh, I think uh, we companies need to, need to adopt uh, and have sustainable CX strategies in place now because what this pandemic has taught us is that this kind of digital customer service or customer experience delivery platforms are here to stay. And uh, people have uh, realized that nothing gets stopped. Everything is possible. Education, uh, meeting your doctor, everything moves on. It's just that it's ha it's happening in a different mode right now. So it will be great if uh, we could study online and get accredited degrees. And uh, I mean, of course, there is uh, there there are pros and cons to everything. I mean, uh, no comparing, no comparison with the face-to-face -face interaction and the socializing. If there is one thing that I can, I can, I wish can go away, will be the social distancing that everyone has to maintain these days. But um, I think we, what we have realized, it was a self-awareness uh, uh, for all and for brands that we need to focus on uh, digital transformation, focus on uh, using technology in customer experience delivery and focus on the health and well-being of your customers and employees. So these were elements which, although we knew were important, suddenly the focus has changed. Now we, we, we value the well-being and the health of our customers. We value the well-being and health of our employees because ultimately, if they are not there, we are not able to serve, you know. So this pandemic has been an eye-opener for, for us all. And I, I think you mentioned I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toss it over to Anna here to answer sort of in, in the similar way of, about the industry prop-ups. But what you said about the, um, you know, the, the distance between us, uh, I sort of win that award, by the way. Uh, I'm... I looked it up earlier. I'm 8,600 miles away from Abu Dhabi, which I think both in terms of time zone and in terms of uh, distance, I might be the winner. But I, I also see it as a benefit that um, I used to go to these events all the time, um, be there in person. And now I get to be home in person and at, at the events like I am today. So um, Anna, from your perspective, perspective uh has it been good that these uh different types of digital uh i won't call them revolutions but evolutions have popped up uh and are they making the customer experience better experience i think that covid teaches us and actually that they're easier way to do things instead of all of us going to the certain place and meeting and um changing our schedules to accommodate everyone now we're meeting in this way and actually we're saving the time uh from the customer point of view i think it was eyes opener because we have learned that instead of maybe spending time in the, in the shops and browsing in many hours we would now maybe enjoy more time on the beach and actually do online shopping because it's faster it's cheaper and all of these things i think in, in a global in a global way, I think they're always good and bad, and we tr we have just to try to focus on what is actually good outcome of experience and situation like this. So, as someone who is in, in in this kind of industry, I think that we're gonna even learn and teach our consumers that we can collect the inputs not always face to face, but also in this way. Like I love the idea of virtual focus group discussions, and I'm sure that even. Dr. Nicolina will agree that this will simplify the way how we communicate with the consumers and they will love it, I'm sure. Yeah. And I think um, I, I was going to move into 
Dr. Nicolina as well, because um, we're talking about the topic of education. Um, and one of the things, uh, we, we have several um, organizations here in the US that help teach um, CX professionals. Um, we have all sorts of classwork that's all moved online. I personally, in my household, have three students and one educator. I'm probably the only one Ooh. not attending or teaching school at the moment. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Do I know everything or am I just not smart enough to go? But uh, everything has been pretty much remote this semester. Um, I have one student who goes into the school, the actual campus twice a week. Everyone else is remote. She has to go onto campus because you have to do labs on campus. They don't let you take those chemicals home. So, um, you know, online was certainly, uh, here to stay already uh, in the educational environment. Uh, we didn't expect it that the entire experience would move online, but uh, and we expect it to move back closer to sort of an equilibrium at some point. About what are the some of the things that will be adopted within education, and are there other changes that we should expect that you know, hey, it's going to stay this way, and you know, what's the best way to communicate this with our customers in the education industry, our students. Uh, basically, uh, as you mentioned, like changes in education, uh, they came overnight. We were in a situation, we, we had to adopt immediately. Uh, literally, uh, at my university, American University in the Emirates, we were traditional face-to-face -face, uh, university, and uh, we had two weeks to make the transition to online teaching and learning. And actually, I have to say, I'm very, very proud how we did it. <laughs> I have to emphasize this, this because we never ever, if someone asked us at the beginning of this year, we're we going to be in this situation, we'd say like, what's this? Like science fiction, no way that this is going to happen at this way at, and, 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 and in the, that short period of time. And uh, actually uh, also talking about the speed of this change and this overnight digital transformation. Uh, basically, uh, there are some uh, data uh, saying that uh, the digital transformation that was planned for the next 10 years in all areas, including the education, happened over 90 days. So you can imagine, we were doing some um, research last year about the future of education. And then we asked uh, like our participants, especially students and faculty, like faculty from different universities, how do you see future of education? Do you see education going completely digital? Can you imagine students taking classes only from, your, from their home? And the responses were quite divided. Now, if I would give this exact survey, like, oh, I no need to give it, everyone, uh, every response will be 100%. Yes, we can imagine we're living it. <laughs> so we can see this huge shift that happened overnight. What is here uh, to say? I, uh, my personal opinion is that digital transformation of the education sector was long overdue. Education sector uh, stayed in 20th century in many cases. And we are far, uh, almost 20 years, more than 20 years in the 21st century. Uh, we had, when it comes to higher education, we have a generation of digital natives, Generation Z, born after 2000, born digital, entering universities in 2018, 2018-19 academic year. And uh, there were a lot of discussion in, uh, like, uh, within academics, uh, how we should adjust and uh, what are the things that we should adjust and uh, what are the potential benefits and what are the potential challenges that we can face with digital. We never ever imagined that we will be in a situation to uh, live a live experiment on transferring into digital environment immediately. Uh, so uh, going through that, I can see as a professor, as someone teaching from completely online from uh, March, April, so everything is online, uh, I see benefits uh, and of course the major uh, obstacle, the major issue are the two things that you two already mentioned. Uh, so basically one is uh, the lack of the face-to-face -face communication, the lack of uh, uh, interaction, human interaction, and we especially need this for students, for young people. They need to come in another environment. They need to meet, they need, they need to mingle, to spend time with their friends. They need to meet new friends. They need to connect. This is how you make a lifelong connections from the university. This is one thing. 
And uh, another thing is uh, related to, as you mentioned, in some cases we have labs, we have things that we literally cannot do online. It's not possible to give the same level of quality in education. It's always the question how to balance this quality versus uh, what we can offer online. On the, uh, on the other hand, um, this provided a lot of um, place for learning, uh, for growth, and to, uh, for uh, creativity, for more creative teaching and more interactive teaching. So if you want, there are so many different things that we can apply in online environment and in online classrooms. Uh, from the perspective of, uh, again, educational institutions, this enables students to uh, attend classes, even if some case, if they're not physically able to be there, maybe they're, are they're not feeling well, or they have some other commitments or they have to travel. Uh, so this is expanding the opportunities. What I see, again, so far is that, uh, and uh, what I would expect is for education to go in, um, um, in a way of a blended learning, not completely digital, especially uh, when it comes to uh, universities, uh, even high schools, uh, uh, definitely not completely digital. We can talk about digital education for the lifelong learning. This, yes. And this has been really, really well developed already. But when it comes to young people, they need a personal contact. If we are talking about education for even younger kids, uh, the uh, personal contact is must for them. They cannot, you cannot have a child in the first grade that will attend uh, everything digitally. It will, uh, uh, they, they will not have the, the main thing uh, which is related to their socialization, which is related to learning about other people, learning about behavior. Uh, so again, it will depend on the level of, of the educational institution that, that uh, we're seeing. But I do expect to go towards some blended learning approach. I think this is the most realistic thing that, that that might happen and i um <clears throat> i see my good friend uh mike queuing up here he's going to be up here in a couple of minutes talking so i want to go to our wrap-up question i'll start with anna then fatima then uh, dr nicolina um i mean we advise our clients and our colleagues but we're all customers uh and then looking at this from a personal level um and thinking what is the one thing that this pandemic has brought that you welcome or the one thing that you would wish would go away most quickly? Anna, let's we'll start with you. Yeah, Anna, you're on mute. Uh, can you unmute? Oh, this is a really tough question because the last few months I haven't been actually uh, doing the work with the clients because unfortunately market research quite died in the last few months and not, not everyone is thinking that the solution lies in research. People simply forgot to communicate with the customer and how important is it to do so. But I really hope it will bring into the spot that importance of uh, following up with the change because if the world has changed, the consumer changed the most. And we need to put more effort and maybe even more investment into really trying to understand how we as the consumers have changed, how we as the providers have changed and, and all of this. So I think the time that is coming will bring more customer as, as the most important stakeholder of the business and all the topics around the customer. However, what I would like to go away, well, complexity. You know, sometimes people do things in very complex ways while well, there are so simple ways of doing it. And then they make a big deal of it. Well, it's, there are always easier ways to do. So I really hope that our clients will understand that communicating with the customers, with employees, or whatever is the aspect of the market research is not as complicated as they think it is. It's actually very simple. When you do it frequently, when you do it with the, the mind that placed into the, what you want to get from it and when you really care about results, not just doing it so that you make your CEO happy. Uh, Ken, I think you're on mute now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just going to say, I think you were uh, obviously listening to my NPS Plus presentation, Simplify Research. Yeah, <laughs> Simplify, yeah. That's the fact. <laughs> Fatima, uh, for you, I mean, what, what is it, you know, from a personal level, professional level, 
What's the one thing that you welcome because of this pandemic? And what's the one thing you wish would go away? Personal level, I think um, what I welcomed the most was uh, this uh, the self awareness that it taught us, and also to be thankful for so many things, for the freedom that we had. You know, I mean, we overlooked so many. We were blessed actually, and uh, now that I look at it, there's one that one thing that I wish will go away, or something that we can bring back is um, socializing. I mean, I miss uh, not being able to socialize and travel. I mean, we never thought twice before stepping out and just the mere exercises of wearing a mask, washing your hands. I mean, it's, uh, uh, you just realize, I mean, we were so blessed earlier and maybe this is here to stay and maybe we need to be careful. Maybe we took things for granted and now it's a time to, uh, you know, realize and do your part for the society, you know, take care of the things that we have for granted. So from a personal level, I think that is uh, from a professional level, um, a lot of our customers, you know, uh, license is uh, more of a necessity than anything else. I mean, we still see people registering for driving courses, not because they want to learn to drive and have I mean, one, one, they want to get the freedom. I mean, they want to experience the freedom of driving, but also because it opens opportunities for other prospective jobs for them. So it's very challenging for us to deliver a hands-on driver training experience face-to-face, -face, uh, sitting close to each other, especially during this pandemic. So uh, it's very challenging how we deliver this because driving is something which we cannot uh, impart uh, online. So we have tried, tried using the blended learning approach wherein the theory lectures are online, you know, the videos are online, but at the end of the day, you have to sit with your trainer and press the brake and accelerator and drive around and the instructor needs to intervene. So if there is one thing that I could, I, I mean, uh, this is very challenging and I, and I have a lot of respect for our trainers who train uh, close to three, four different types of customers every day. I mean, we do our due diligence, we check the temperature, we ensure everyone's wearing their mask and gloves, but you see there is a fear factor. Everyone is scared, but Life must go on. We need to uh, uh, we need to ensure that the society is getting enough drivers to run our taxis, our buses, transport goods for us, run the ambulance, run the firefighting trucks. So you see, it's it's uh, it's a necessity. But at the same time, we we need we have started respecting and valuing people who are out there doing this for the society to run. Dr. Nicolina, I, I, know, I know you already mentioned digital, uh, the, the idea that we've brought these digital uh, digital immigrants over and converted them to refugees and converted them. What, what, what else? <laughs> what stands out to you as a pro? Uh, no, from the uh, personal perspective, let's start with the good things first. And uh, I think uh, that uh, all, all of us, for me at least, it was the case, you know, for many other people, we had an opportunity to learn and to grow if we wanted to use it, of course. And uh, I personally, as an educator, I learned so many different uh, tools and techniques and integrating those uh, digital tools and techniques into classes. And I know this is the case with the uh, majority of my colleagues. And uh, those things are going to be here to stay. Uh, even if we go back to classroom, we're going to still integrate those things because they're good. And our students are uh, reacting in a very, very positive way. Uh, so uh, the similar thing is uh, when it comes to uh, any consumer in any, uh, any area, we have to see what are the things that are working really well now in this crisis environment and keep them. We have to keep, keep them going and we have to uh, innovate and we have to, of course, measure first to see if they're working well and uh, uh, then uh, uh, to maintain the things that were, that were working, working uh, really good dur during that time. Um, again, when it comes to uh, things that uh, I would like to go away overnight, um, well, uh, the first thing I would start to with uh, is the weight gain uh, during the lockdown. I think many people will agree with me <laughs> on that. <laughs> so that's definitely one thing that many of us would like to like disappear overnight. Uh, but um, other than that, um, I... Um, 
like uh, uh, Fatima said, the thing that uh, I miss most and the thing that I see people are missing most is the social contact and this social distances, distancing is taking its toll. Uh, now uh, we are mm, in, a, in the, the prolonged period of time of a change the behavior of the change patterns of behavior. We human as species, we are social beings. We need other people. Uh, we need to interact. We need not only virtual contact, we need physical contact. Uh, so I think that uh, this is the thing that I definitely miss very much. And this is the thing that uh, I hear so many times from my students. Oh, professor, we're just missing the classes. We just want to come. We want to be there. And we're talking to colleagues, like, when are we going to come back to work? We just want to, you know, we, we want, uh, you know, before this, many people were dreaming about working from home. That yeah. would be like ideal job. We want to work from home. I would really, really like to see after working from home, six months, seven months with uh, small kids, cats, dogs, <laughs> different distractions all around you. I would really like to see people who say, oh, no, I never ever want to go to a to, 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 to workplace. However, we do see that some of the companies, even worldwide, are now providing an a option for their employees to work completely online. For example, Microsoft was one of the companies that recently introduced this and they said, if the employees want to work online, they, uh, they, they, they can work remotely and uh, there is no need for them to have a working space in an office. I don't see this as a, you know, as think that that, that that should be the prevalent mode of work and, and communication uh, because it focuses us only on what needs to be done. But we are more than that, even as a working people. We are social people, we are social beings, and uh, we cannot make connections and communicate in a way that I believe a majority of, not, uh, of us needs. And I, I also believe there's also a global impact that you're, you're, when, you're, when you're working from home, there's some great benefits. Um, we're reducing transit times, we're spending more time at home. I know these because I've been doing it for 22 years. Flip side, you're right, you miss that social interaction. Um, I've, I've, I was fortunate before I started at Question Pro, I had met many of my colleagues before I even started. Um, so I, I was fortunate there, but I've, I've run into people that are now starting new jobs and three, six months in have never met any of their colleagues and working remotely. So that social side, I think the, the prof will put something in the chat box. I'd like the government travel restrictions and rules to go away globally. And I would second that because instead of doing this via Zoom, we'd all be together on a stage talking to each other um, and presenting collectively. So with that, I wanna say thank you to all three of my panelists. Thank you, Anna, for jumping in, really appreciate it. And I will turn it over to Mike.